I can apply, you know, the, the latest methods to reinvestigate cases with the idea of discrediting what I say. I would welcome that. <clears throat> but um, as I you was know, showing, in some cases, even if the latest dating methods are applied, then there can still be resistance to the conclusions. <clears throat> so, another question. My name is uh, Raksi Jariwala. I do some research in the biological sciences. I have a question with respect to the Vedic perspective that you mentioned. First of all, you present evidence that the origin of humans may go back to millions of years prior to Darwin. So, from a Vedic perspective then, if we accept the fact that humans existed millions and millions of years ago, what would the perspective be? If this is a hypothesis or even a current consensus, uh, current thinking, as to the relationship with other species. Whether other species, that is lower species, coexisted at that time with humans, or did they come later, such as reverse evolution or reverse Darwinism? Because there could be some support in the Vedic concept in terms of consciousness that if humans have had the high, most highly evolved consciousness and somehow they lose it or fall, they would descend into a lower species. So can we entertain that idea then that if you go back to 40 million years ago that humans existed, that other species may or may not have coexisted, but may have appeared later in time, such as a reverse evolution. Yes. <laughs> Short answer to a nice question. It sort of leads into another whole talk, which I don't know if I have time to give here. I've been speaking with some of the organizers you know, that perhaps I'll be invited another time in which I can talk more directly about your question, because I have written a whole book about it, Human Devolution, a Vedic Alternative to Darwin's Theory, <clears throat> which gets into those questions. But just briefly, say, I would say the picture is more one of coexistence than anything else. <clears throat> The Vedic historical writings, the Puranas, Mahabharata, Ramayana, they speak about eight men, for example. It's not an idea that was first thought of you know, by European scientists in the 18th and 19th centuries. There's a category of being called the Vanars, which had ape-like bodies, human-like intelligence, a simple level of material culture. And humans like us existed alongside them. So I would say the, the basic picture is one of coexistence of various life forms. And you mentioned according to level of consciousness. So this, this is a fundamental difference between a Vedic perspective and say, a modern scientific perspective. Um, a modern sci scientific perspective generally involves seeing a human being or any other living thing as just a complex machine made of molecules. Or they may put it in a different sense. Maybe a machine isn't always the best metaphor, but they would say, you know, a complex organization of molecules, no more than that. The and as far as consciousness is concerned, they would say, okay, if you organize the molecules in the brain in a sufficiently complex way, they generate as a byproduct what we call consciousness. The Vedic perspective is consciousness-based rather than matter-based. 
Matter does not produce consciousness. Consciousness exists independently from matter. And however, matter can come into, um, excuse me, consciousness can come into association with matter. And according to the nature of consciousness, or you could say the level of consciousness, the association of matter will be configured in different ways. <clears throat> So according to this view, all bodies are vehicles for conscious selves. Human bodies, plant bodies, animal bodies, they're all vehicles for conscious selves. And according to the level of consciousness, consciousness is associated with a certain type of material covering. And it can go in either direction. Consciousness can be covered by a very simple type of material covering. And if consciousness evolves, then it will, in the course of reincarnation, successive material embodiments achieve more and more complex forms. Or it could go back, devolve. <clears throat> But that's a whole other lecture. <laughs> but I did want to give you some answer. Yes? Um, my question is maybe a little bit more basic. I'm not especially um, familiar with, with the Vedic literature. But what's the, what can you explain the connection between the Vedic literature and what sent you off into looking at the, at the, the European literature in so many different countries? Yes. <clears throat> Um, I was born in the United States, <clears throat> and my father was a military officer, so I grew up in a lot of different places. <clears throat> and that opened me to the idea that there's more than one way to look at things. Say the Western American way is one way of looking, but there are other people in the world who have you know, different ways of looking at things. That, that was part of the way that I was raised. When I was growing up, I lived in lots of different countries. So I, I got exposed to a lot of different cultures, a lot of different worldviews. I think that had an influence on me. Uh, among the different worldviews that I encountered as I was growing up, the Worldview of ancient India was very attractive to me for some reason, and I pursued it <clears throat> on a lot of different levels. But one of the levels that I pursued it was to investigate the literature. So a lot of the literature has to do with meditation and yoga and different topics like that. But there's also an historical literature. <clears throat> and it was in that historical literature, the Puranas, that I encountered these descriptions of human populations existing on Earth millions of years ago in the course of a cyclical concept of time. So it was something, it was an idea that was completely different from anything I'd ever learned from my teachers in high school or university. So uh, with Richard Thompson, who is a co-religionist of mine, we decided, well, uh, is, is, are these accounts to be taken as mythological, or is there perhaps some factual, evidential basis for what's being presented? So that's what inspired me to look into the history of archaeology. And I tried to do a very thorough job. So yeah, at university I studied Russian. I lived in Germany. I knew German. I lived for some time in Texas, so I knew Spanish. I had a reading knowledge of a lot of different languages, so I just pursued pursued the task of looking at the whole record. 
Yeah. Oh, well, I don't, somebody has to manage this. We'll probably take from this side now. Yeah, go front to back, give everybody a, a chance. Um, my question is uh, slightly associated with the one you just answered, but I asked if I'm going to angle and then I uh, kind of with another one. What do you think, what's your hypothesis of why there isn't other people who did a similar job and you did? I know you say because of your background uh, being uh, international, but I would say there would be also others, so what could be possible other reason? Because I did notice that in other fields, such as neuroscience, um, around the time you are uh, doing the research, starting from the 1990s up to this um, uh, century, quite a few people started doing like a match uh, analysis, meaning combine a lot of things, the research, to see what's in there, to gain perspective. And then they did get a perspective like what you have in your field. So I'm just wondering, is there tiny time you any, like, is there any technology uh, support behind this or not? That's the first question. Then the second question is, what's your goal or what's your, how do you think you can achieve um, uh, the objective of uh, spreading, that like, enlightening people uh, the way you, uh, with the knowledge you have? So I think this is very important type of knowledge to spread as much as possible. Okay, the first part of the question has to do is there perhaps any, any technological reason for the ability to do this kind of meta research, you know, looking over vast amounts of material. <clears throat> and I started this research in 1984, which means a lot of the resources that are available today were not available to me <clears throat> when I started this research and practically throughout the entire period that I was doing the fundamental research for this book. Um, in other words, there wasn't a World Wide Web, at least not one that was you know, generally available. Um, and, you know, computerization of library systems and things like that would have so I was fortunate to have a research assistant who was a professional librarian who had run a science research library for an agency of the government, <coughs> forestry service actually. And uh, she became interested in my work. <coughs> so she knew how to get things from all over the world through the interlibrary loan system and, and things like that. So the research that I did you know, between, say, 1984 and 1992 for the book Forbidden Archaeology was done in a kind of like a pre-web era and it was done, you could say, that way. So I would say it wasn't any technological sort of advancement that inspired me or enabled me to do that. Now, of course, today, you know, the, the advances in digitizing a lot of these publications, you know, even these archival publications, is a big help. <laughs> it does facilitate this kind of thing, but the work that I did for the research that I've described today wasn't done in that way. The other question, other part of your question, you know, how do I hope to uh, accomplish my goals? <clears throat> I, my goals, I try to accomplish by staying in touch with a lot of different parties. I think at this moment in time, the world is undergoing kind of a fundamental renegotiation of its overall conception of reality, its paradigm, whatever you want to call it. I think there are a lot of parties to that negotiation. <clears throat> there are 
people who are totally on the spiritual side, and some people totally on the scientific side. There are some people who are uh, mixing them. There are uh, there's the general public, the different areas of popular interest and alternative ideas. I try to stay in touch with all of them, and I try to communicate in a lot of different ways. You know, I communicate by speaking at scientific conferences, at universities. I also go on popular TV shows and radio shows, and not just in this country, but all over the world. So there are a lot of things that I try to do to accomplish you know, my goals. But here is one very specific thing that I would like to see. Um, it has to do with ending the monopoly that the supporters of the now dominant theories have in the public education system. Because, say, the supporters of the now dominant theories of human origins and origin of species now have they've been granted by the government in one way or another a government enforced monopoly in the public education system so that only their ideas can be presented which I think is not really proper in a country or a society that considers itself democratic <clears throat> I would say, okay, it's a fact that today most scientists, let's put a figure on it, 99 or 95 or 98 percent accept the dominant theories. <clears throat> but it's also a fact there are some in the world of science who don't, who are proposing alternatives. Intelligent design, the kind of things that I'm talking about, uh, other alternatives. And one of the reasons that I mentioned the, the publications and the presentations at, co at conferences is to show that on a certain level, this element of the discourse is tolerated. <clears throat> but it's excluded from the official education system, which has the effect of delegitimizing ideas, alternative ideas, in the minds of students who are going through the education system, from secondary school to you know the bachelor's degrees to the graduate degrees, it has the effect of delegitimizing alternative ideas. And I then the proper solution is that in the education system, this is what I would like to see, and I think it would be a big contribution to what, I, what I'm trying to accomplish, would be, okay, let's admit, the vast majority of scientists now accept certain ideas. So give them the vast majority of pages in the textbooks. <clears throat> but somewhere in some small percentage of the textbook pages, it should be neutrally <coughs> and objectively stated that there are some who are proposing alternative ideas and state their reasons neutrally and objectively. And then just let students make up their own minds about these things. <laughs> and I think that would be, in terms of what I'm trying to accomplish, a major step forward. And even some supporters of the currently dominant theories, when I explain this idea to them, they kind of see the, the logic of it. They may resist it on a certain level, but I think intellectually they can see morally it's the correct thing to do. <clears throat> Something else. So um, I, I'm, I was just curious if uh, through your um, research work, whether uh, along with uh, evidence for um, 
experience having existed in millions of years ago, whether you uh, uncovered or came upon uh, some evidence about uh, advanced technology uh, being uh, available to humans uh, in, in ancient times. Uh, you read in the Puranas about things like Vimanas or even, um, weapons of you know, mass destruction. There's even a theory that the Mahabharat war may have been the first uh, nuclear war, and uh, the Vedas talk about construction of Vimanas and such like. And I've even, I think, heard maybe this was with the History Channel um, that the Mohenjo Daro uh, site had evidence for fused rock that might have been some evidence of you know, atomic. Uh, explosions and stuff. Have you encountered anything to either corroborate or otherwise uh, this kind of conjecture? Short answer, no. <clears throat> but uh, you've touched on an important point. There are a couple of different ways to learn about the past. One of them is by what we can find in the layers of the earth. One is what we can find in historical records. <clears throat> and I think both are valid. And sometimes what's found in historical records can be an inspiration to conduct research. You know, for example, Troy was discovered by a researcher who was inspired by the descriptions of that city and you know, the Iliad and the Odyssey, you know, to conduct some research. So, from a textual source, he got the inspiration to do some physical research, and he was able to find things that were consistent with <clears throat> the textual sources. So, as a methodology, I think that's good, and I think it should be looked into. Now, <clears throat> Um, whether we're talking about <clears throat> high levels of human culture or lower, more simpler, simpler levels, the very first thing, there has to be a human population there. So I think what I've demonstrated with the research that I've done so far is that human populations were there. And for all details about their levels of culture and technology, I think that's a question for further research. And I don't think what I've done is answered every question. I think what I'm trying to do is create a framework, a research program, which would be a framework for asking questions, which can then be investigated. Like the question, you just raised about evidence for possible high technological accomplishments of human populations that existed millions of years ago is not a question you could raise within the framework of the current research paradigm. It just doesn't make any sense. It's not a question you could ask. Within the framework that I'm proposing, your question makes sense. <clears throat> And there could be research carried out to test, say, that idea. So, now, <coughs> one problem is that a lot of the things that we consider signs of high technology don't preserve well in the layers of the Earth over millions of years. And this is something that scientists have looked into recently in connection with environmental studies. You know, some scientists have been very concerned about the impact that our modern human civilization is having on the Earth. So some of them are proposing, well, they're asking the question, what if human beings just vanish today from the Earth? What would happen to the remains of our worldwide technological civilization, our huge cities, so on and so forth. How long would it last? Um, there have been interdisciplinary studies that have investigated this question and resulted in you know, publications like the book World Without Us, 
in you know, some documentaries that have shown on you know, Discovery and History Channel and things of that sort. And the conclusion that they've reached is it wouldn't last very long. Metals oxidize, you know, if fires burned uncontrolled through our cities, it would destroy a lot. Earthquakes, if our water control systems, dams, floodgates, seawalls broke down, floods would wipe away a lot. So that after many millions of years, there'd hardly be anything at all left, almost nothing. That's the kind of conclusions that they're reaching. So let's imagine, say, we were talking about the California gold mine discovery, some stone mortars and pestles, obsidian spear points, things like that. What if at the same time, 50 million years ago, human beings were also using, you know, iPads, <laughs> computers, mobile phones, smartphones, things like that. Uh, now the stone mortars and pestles, they're going to last for 50 million years. The iPad may not last for 50 million years because the plastics will degrade. You know, there are science museums now that are trying to preserve the first plastics that were made in the 19th century. They're having a hard time with it because they're disintegrating. You know, it's a, even, even some of the more recent plastics, you know, they're disintegrating. So they have to, you know, the curators of the science museums, technology museums, have to really struggle to keep these things in shape. Metals will oxidize, except gold and some other metals that don't oxidize. So even if there was a population that had these kinds of achievements, then you know, the, the stone tools may last, but these other things won't. Unless maybe you, know, you did some isotopic research, maybe you saw you know, alongside the stone mortar and pestle, some smear of stuff. And maybe if you did some isotopic analysis of it, you could find in it, you know, some isotopes of metals that don't naturally occur, you know, that have to be manufactured in a laboratory or something. Then you might get some. But who's doing that now? Because the question you raise can't be raised in the current environment. So what I'm hoping to do is create uh, a framework in which such questions can be asked and in which some new generation of researchers could actually do research to answer those kinds of questions. Thank you for your very nice presentation. Um, one of the points I think that we try to make, perhaps the most important point, is the fact that the intellectual community, the majority of the scientific community, is uh, resistant towards new ideas or things that would change the dominant paradigm, which is uh, existing. Some parts, not all. Okay, some, yeah. So uh, my question pertains to the part of archaeological evidence and the scientific thought process behind the um, portion of the evidence which does support uh, Darwinian evolution, evolutionary theory. Because it is, um, uh, for, for, a, uh, for a person who is ignorant of uh, or not very much knowledgeable about this field, it would be hard to believe that you know a big portion of the scientific um, community would only be prejudiced or just be resistant towards new ideas because that would oppose their existing thinking. So I'm interested to learn about what is that part of the scientific evidence 
which does support Darwinian evolution and is there a reason why the majority of the you know popular uh, scientific uh, uh, scientists think uh, that this is the right theory uh, of that explains human evolution and the the reason I ask this question is um, I have attended other uh, presentations on um, such topics and I also personally know certain individuals who are who I know are honest and objective and uh, um, you know not prejudiced but still uh, they believe that Darwinian evolution is, evolutionary theory is the right uh, theory that extends the origin of um, humans. So I'm just curious to know what you would have to say. Yeah. About well, first of all. I respect intellectual freedom and academic freedom, which means I respect the right of any individual you know, to come to whatever conclusion that individual thinks appropriate or best explain, is best, best explains the evidence or is best explained by the evidence. You know, I respect that idea of intellectual and academic freedom. What I would, my question is not that somebody looks at all the evidence and decides it supports the Darwinian theory of evolution and so they accept it. That's not my objection. My objection is that sometimes such persons as a group will make efforts to exclude other ideas. I'm not saying that, you know, that it, I mean, I, just, I understand that, that many people do find the evidence, or they find certain categories of evidence convincing. I may not. <clears throat> and others may not. But that isn't where I see, you know, the problem. <clears throat> yeah, I see the problem in trying to get a monopoly in the public education system. <clears throat> That's, I would say, <laughs> You know, if people want to establish their own schools and teach only their idea to the exclusion of all other ideas, I think anyone has a, a right to do that. But if we're taking tax money from all of the people <laughs> and, you know, you're going to use it, taking tax money from all the people, including me, to impose your idea to the exclusion of every other idea, I think that's where the problem is. Uh, so, I think the reason, there's a, a, another underlying issue here, and it has to do with the metaphysical framework <clears throat> that uh, scientific research is conducted under. And this is like a deeper problem. Like, now, there are many who feel that science can be conducted only to, according to one set of metaphysical assumptions, which are quite materialistic in terms of what they assume metaphysically about the world we live in and how it can possibly be known. Now, it hasn't always been like that in the world of science. Say if we go back to Europe in the mid-19th century at the time of Darwin, science was being conducted under what I call metaphysical pluralism. There were, say, in biology, there were some scientists who were conducting their research into biology under platonic metaphysical principles, like Richard Owen, for example. 
know, he had the idea that there were platonic forms of uh, animal bodies that existed on some higher level that were being projected you know, to the level of material reality and expressed here. Uh, there were scientists in Germany, the Naturphilosophs, who were conducting scientific research according to metaphysical principles that recognized the existence of vital forces and principles that were in some sense guiding you know, the biological structures. There were some scientists who were conducting their biological research according to Judeo-Christian metaphysics that involved the idea of special creation. Actually, that was the dominant idea in the English universities at the time Darwin first started his research. So Darwin was conducting his research into biology according to a rather strictly materialist metaphysics. And this was reflected across a whole range of sciences, sciences not just biology, but also physics, psychology, chemistry. If you really look at you know, the history of science, somewhere you, you could see that at, different, at that time in the history of Western science, there was metaphysical pluralism. <clears throat> and then around the time of World War I, that metaphysical pluralism started to end. And I think it had a lot to do with science wanting to serve government. <laughs> and they decided we had better get our act together. <laughs> if we do, we'll get lots of support from governments and corporations. And it was a pretty effective strategy, as far as I can see. But I think it made science a little less interesting. <laughs> than, uh, the point of view. So, uh, what I'm, you know, my larger goal, you could say, is to reintroduce metaphysical pluralism back into the world of science. Okay. Thank you all very much for your kind attention. So we'd like to uh, thank Michael Primo for such a very interesting presentation and hope that uh, he will come back, as, as promised, uh, with some uh, further talks. And, um, Please don't leave yet. Uh, of course, uh, as in all the Bhakti Yoga Club and Pacific Learning Alliance programs here, we have, we have a dinner, a uh, free vegetarian dinner that we're serving. We want everyone to enjoy the, uh, the dinner. Um, Dr. Primo's books are here on the table. Uh, he probably will sell out of all of these books. I think a lot of you will be interested to, to, to purchase them. Uh, they're also available on Amazon.com and everything. Uh, but you can get signed copies here tonight from Dr. Primo, and we encourage you all to come up and, uh, and purchase his books. We also, uh, Bhakti Yoga Club, uh, of course, uh, makes presentation on Vedic literature, Bhagavad Gita, and so forth. And we have uh, spiritual books about yoga and Krishna consciousness also available. Uh, where are the uh, spiritual books? We have limited copies of spiritual books as well. Uh, they're underneath here, or okay. So we ask you to also uh, those of you who haven't read Bhagavad Gita or some of the other uh, books about Vedic literature, we encourage you to read uh, those too. Please, we have handouts for everyone um, coming up uh, in uh, May 8th. It's a Tuesday night, a couple weeks from now. Uh, we have Dr. Howard J. Resnick. Um, professor Resnick uh, is a professor, PhD from Harvard in Sanskrit, has been teaching at UCLA, UC Berkeley's Graduate Theological Union, and also uh, most recently in the University of um, Florida in Gainesville. 
and uh, teaches about Indian philosophy and religion. Very interesting uh, genius, uh, and he's going to give some perspectives on science and spirituality. Um, the title of his talk will be Science and Spirituality, What Next? And uh, we do want to thank uh, the organizers, uh, Bhakti Yoga Club and Pacific Learning Alliance, the very many volunteers who cooked a wonderful uh, vegetarian dinner and who've uh, organized this event and advertised it. Uh, please give a hand to all the volunteers. There's really too many of them for me to try to uh, identify and thank anyone um, specifically, individually. Um, I'm sure I would leave too many people out. Let me see what other announcements we have. That's it. We, we can have introduction. Yeah. Dr. Kirome will be available, so we can have personal introduction. Yes, and, and Dr. Kirome is available. Uh, be here to sign books, to discuss things with you, answer other questions. The dinner is being served out right out front here, on this side here. So please do enjoy the dinner and, and hang around and discuss things with Dr. Primo and uh, hope you come back on May 8th. Thanks. And one more thing. Um, we're also passing out these uh, evaluation forms, flyers, that you can talk, uh, let us know what other kinds of topics you'd like to hear about and how you...